Hey guys, we're back again. Ken Ackerthorn, Wilson Combat, my buddy Matthew. Another segment, and while I had Matt here, I wanted an opportunity to talk to him and ask him some questions about, for the last 40 years, you've been pretty active involved in a number of facets we've talked about. But I know that if I was to ask you whether from the competition end of it, from the uh, gun riding part of it, or the training, which venue is your favorite? Which would you, if you had to limit yourself to one? Without one. question, the training. Yeah, the, absolutely. The, I, the, I the think imparting that, of knowledge, yeah. the, seeing somebody improve and be safe. Yeah. And over that span of, say, the last 40 years, where what we'll call action shooting has really advanced. You and I both mm -hmm. knew the era where if you were in the private sector, you shot bullseye, or if you were in law enforcement, yeah. you bought PPC, and that was it for that pistol it. shooting. And to, to credit of Jeff Cooper, he launched, he's the guy that lit the fuse. That Absolutely. Up. What are the things you've seen over the last 40 years that you see as a result that are positive benefits that's come out of all of this? Big thing, expansion of the number of gun owners and the huge expansion of lawful concealed carry. Uh, the, the, the many states now that have permitless carry the, the overall switch from the norm was may, we may issue the permit if we feel like it, to no, you shall issue the permit or show good cause, why not? We have the training that's available. In those same days when Bullseye was the only game in town, the only training available to the private citizen was once a year going to the uh, Bullseye shooting school at Camp Perry shooting like this. True. <coughs> Today we have Within a year of each other in the mid-1970s, Jeff Cooper established the American Pistol Institute gun site, and Ray Chapman and uh, Dick Thomas established the Chapman Academy. Yeah. And you and I saw where it snowballed from there. It's now literally a, a significant industry, training private citizens in judicious use of deadly force and self-defense. Yeah. Um, Equipment-wise, what have you? I know you. This, we know there's so much; it's hard to cover it very briefly. But of, this, of the things you've seen equipment-wise that you would say really is an advancement, that things that you think are, are beneficial. What would you? But better guns, better holsters, definitely better ammunition. Uh, what a whole lot of people miss: they they just look at the trigger pulling side. Mike Dillon gave us the affordable progressive reloader yeah. that made probably the single most important thing yep. Yep. Made, made affordable practice within yep. the reach of so many more american citizens absolutely uh, before yeah. it was you know the, the rich guy or the sponsored professional uh who had the star reloader yep uh today with the dylan there are many many more proficient shooters uh again the, the availability of training mm -hmm. uh, while there are some great self-taught champions uh just on the average you a week uh here a weekend there it saves what would have been years of figuring it out by yourself, you know, trying to reinvent the wheel. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. You know, one of the things I've seen, you, you and I and a lot of people of our generation were self-taught. Unfortunately, we learned a lot, a lot of bad stuff, and it took a long time to get over it. I see a lot of new shooters that don't have that training curve. They start off with the good fundamentals, and, uh, and they come along a lot quicker. I think that we see that. Mm -hmm. Uh, now we have so many more also competitive shooting sports. We yeah, have yeah. three gun now. We have sporting clays. We have cowboy action shooting. Um, you got steel challenge, IDPA, USPSA, yeah, three gun. National Shooting Sports uh, Federation did the study that showed more, am more dollars uh, from recreational family budgets are spent in America today on some, part, some element of the shooting sports than are spent on golf. And no one ever saw that coming back when one or two guys in the neighborhood might belong to the gun club. Yep. Yeah, and you know, I, I tell people, Bill Wilson was the only guy, when we started IDPA, he was enough of a visionary. He saw this concealed carry movement. I'll be honest with you, I didn't believe it. I thought that's never gonna happen. And I think you would agree, we were not. I was, I was a pessimist, but I'm glad to have been proven wrong. Yeah, so I think that's a, had a huge, currently you'd have to say that's probably one of the biggest facets of the growth of the gun culture is the CCW. It has been Second Amendment's foundation's lawsuits that have led to so many victories on the state and local level. And at the national level, the, uh, the Heller decision and the McDonald decision have been absolutely huge for gun owner civil rights. Yeah. 
Now, if you were to look back and to the present of things that have happened, trends, ideas, whatever, that you would put in, shall we say, the minus category, are there things that come to mind? On our side, things that are are well-intentioned but can be taken the wrong way by the, the many people who demonize us. Uh, I've made it clear for years, look, we, uh, uh, the, the gun owner civil rights movement has a great deal in common with the, the gay rights movement. In both cases, we are closeted minorities That's true. feared and hated by people who don't begin to understand us. That's very true. The gay people were smarter than us. They didn't get the, make the huge advances they've made with, uh, you know, parades and uh, doing obscene things in the middle of the street. They did it with a campaign that said, we are your brothers and your sisters and your neighbors and your sons and your daughters. When I see people today, however well-meaning, thinking, gee, I'll do a Second Amendment audit, I'll carry my AR-15 into the local supermarket, and somehow this will normalize guns and everyone will say this is wonderful. No, it isn't. In a time when a handful of sick monsters have killed innocent people, and our media blamed us for that when they were the ones who aggrandized them, when they were the ones who made it clear to every thwarted loser in America, get a gun, murder some innocent people, and we'll have you every five minutes in tape loops for a week you famous. on CNN, you saw the Columbine killers on the cover of Time. You saw the Boston bomber on the cover of Rolling Stone. And we see it again and again each single time. The last three of them, uh, the, 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 the one that's alive, can sit in prison and brag, I am changing, Amer I was the impetus to change American gun law. If that's what the public is seeing, one of us, however well-intentioned, walking into a Starbucks with, a, with an AR-15 or a Walmart with an AR or something like that, you've got to know it's going to frighten the public. We, we need to stop that. Uh, a whole lot of us wonder if the people doing that aren't really paid to do it by Michael Bloomberg to give us a bad name. Yeah. We've got to understand that what we do has to be explained to the general public or it'll be taken out of context. Now, case in point, um, I had the privilege of uh, running the first uh, IPSC sectional championship right after the Columbia Conference. Uh, you were one of the founders of both IPSC and uh, IDPA. And all over YouTube, you can see the scenarios of run and gun, bangity, bangity, bangity. And as you pointed out earlier, talking privately, it looks like someone mimicking a John Wick movie. We know that we're not teaching the public, and the public knows when they come there. It's not, I'm going to go in and, uh, you know, shoot 20 terrorists. Uh, if I look at an IDPA stage, and I think any thinking person does is, okay, there's an intruder in that possibly might be an armed intruder in my home. He might be in any of nine different places in these next two rooms, and I've got to know how to engage him and take cover from him at any of those nine different angles. And that's what happens when we run that stop clock and you put a couple of bullets into each of the nine targets. But somebody takes that YouTube video clip of someone doing that and says, look, here are these evil NRA terrorist gun owners, according to the city of San Francisco, that uh, pr are practicing murdering nine, how fast they can kill nine unarmed brown men. You were a founder of IDPA. I came into it after you, but fairly early. In those early days, the shoot targets had a gun stencil to them, had a knife or stencil a knife, to them. Yeah. And for efficiency, it took a while to do that. And because we assumed all of our people know what the mindset is, that fell by the wayside. Given the horrendous negative propaganda we're all getting, I think it would be a wonderful time for IDPA to go back to that. So those images, those videos can't be subverted and used to tell the public we are something we are not. Yeah, and I, I tend to agree with you. I'm, my concern is, you know, when IPSC started, it was designed as a basically a tool in which you, through organized, structured competition, you would improve your self-defense skills. And but for the first four or five years, it was combat shooting by definition. We were drawing service pistols from holsters. We were learning a lot of new stuff. Um, 
IDPA came along and we looked at it, <laughs> excuse me, as the a defensive pistol competition. And uh, I remember early on, one of our guidelines was that in any IDPA stage, there would never be more than 10 yards of movement. Now we know in the real world, when the shooting starts, people start moving, we know that. But they don't move a long ways or a lot. They move just to get to safety, generally. They, they move to where they perceive safety is. And what I've seen as of late, IDPA has become a lot like USPSA. It's become run and gun matches. Mm -hmm. And with, like you say, multiple targets. Um, cover isn't as much of an issue as it once was. And it, it's, it seems like to say today it's International Defensive Pistol Association, in many ways, what's going on, you'd be better off to say International Offensive Pistol Association. And that concerns me, like you, how it can be perceived. Yeah, we, we know that's not the intent. Uh, we also know that if 10% of the electorate is on our side and 10% is hardcore on the other side, and we'll change that the that other middle side. That middle ground is if we don't explain our side, who we are and what we do, we are going to be deliberately misinterpreted and smeared. And I think that what so many people in America don't grasp today, the left certainly has figured it out, is it's not about news, it's about propaganda. And how you provide the propaganda and the image. I mean, Joseph Stalin, you know, Joe Goebbels, they figured that out pretty quick. If you show, tell people, tell them a lie enough, eventually they'll believe it. Mm -hmm. And we're being subject to that right now. And I, I'm concerned about it just like you are. I, I think that probably like you, the bulk of what we've seen happen in the last 40 years has been positive from our side. For the most part, and not a lot of negativity. I just, I just would prefer that people realize that, you know, much of shooting competition has become a fantasy, kind of acting out a fantasy and maybe a touch step or two back to the reality might make a little bit more sense. But it's interesting, your approach and uh, to both the pluses and minuses kind of mirrors my attitude too. Well, I appreciate your candor. Thank you very much, Mass. Thank you, brother. Thanks Great working with do. you. Always. Take care. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed it. I know you're on the Wilson Combat YouTube channel watching this right now, but be sure and push that subscribe button. Lots of good information coming your way in the future. Stay safe. Take care. Till next time. Mm -hmm.